Last week, we celebrated Easter. We remembered the resurrection and we worshiped the Savior who defeated sin, conquered death, and changed our eternity forever. Now, the work begins. For the miracle of Easter was never meant to be kept secret. It was never meant to be quiet. Instead, it was meant to change hearts and lead people to Jesus. Easter was the beginning of our calling, a mission to share the love of Christ, this unimaginable hope with the world. For even now, the echoes of the resurrection remind us our work is not finished. For our mandate remains the same, to share the hope of Jesus and the life-changing power of the resurrection to the ends of the earth. This is the work of Easter.
Well, hello, River Church, River Church, Franklin Park, River Church, New Kensington. So glad you're with us. Thanks for being here. Hey, do me a favor. Do Dean a favor, especially Dean. He loves this. Share it, like it, subscribe to it. Uh, just share it to whoever. Don't worry how many times you share it. The Dean loves that. So I'm Pastor Mark Helso. I'm the pastor at the River Franklin Park. So glad to be with you and to give this message to both campuses. I hope you're in uh, strapping in for a great one. It's going to be it's going to be a, a wild, wild ride. Hey, I think we could all pretty much agree that it's been a crazy two years. It's been, it's been unlike any other two years of my life. But if you look around the world, it's been pandemic, it's been crazy politics, it's been wildfires, social unrest, now a war in Europe, uh, and even they even had locusts in Africa, swarms of locusts, like biblical proportions. That wasn't my words. That was the people that reported it. It was their words. Biblical proportions of locusts, murder hornets. Remember that one? Murder hornets. And even Kanye and Kim got divorced. It's been a crazy couple years, right? And, and my frequent question that I got in the middle of these last two years, people would give me frequent question was, hey, is this the end? Is this the end? Is this the la are these the last days? Are we living in the last days? And so I got that question a lot. And, and uh, here we are, we're going to actually do a series. This is today the beginning of a series called In the Last Days, Wisdom for the End. And we are going to look at the last days. We're going to ask those questions. We're going to go there. We're going to go to some places that we haven't gone to as the river, maybe ever, or at least in a, a very long time. Well, let me just say this. If you've asked that question, you're in good company because many people have thought that throughout history, even the disciples asked that question of Jesus. When was the world going to end? And when were things going to be forever changed? A lot of people have asked that question. In fact, I read a story this week when I was, when I was preparing for this message about something that happened in 1910 when Halley's Comet returned where we could see it on Earth. And it reappeared and Chicago, in Chicago, the Yerkes Observatory announced that it had detected a poisonous gas in the comet called cyanogen. It sounds like cyanide, right? In the comet's tail. Then the New York Times posted a story where a noted French astron astronomer believed the gas would enter our atmosphere and possibly snuff out all life on the planet. Now, many scientists jumped in and refuted that and tried to ease people's fears. But guess what? The damage was done. The cat was out of the bag. People rushed out. They bought gas masks like crazy. And I'm sure they bought toilet paper too. We, we learned that lesson a couple years ago. They bought things called comet pills. I have no idea what that was, but somebody made some bank on that. The New York Times reported that terror had seized hold of a large portion of Chicago's population. The Atlanta Constitution, another huge newspaper, reported people in Georgia were preparing safe rooms and even covering the keyholes in their doors with paper. And actually, this is my favorite part of the story. The paper said that there was one man who had armed himself with a gallon of whiskey and requested his friends lower him down into a 40 foot deep dry well. Sounds like a party, doesn't it? Party like it's 1999, buddy, or 1910. So people all throughout history have thought the end of the world was coming. Actually, I remember a time in my life in 2011 on May 21st at 6 p.m., I can tell you exactly where I was. That's 2011, May 21st at 6 p.m. I was on my way home from a men's retreat with my good friend Brad, and we had just walked out of the convenience store, and we were watching the clock to see when it turned at 6, at six o'clock, waiting to see if the world was going to end. 
Now, we were doing it jokingly, but why were we doing that? Well, because there was a guy named Harold Camping, a Christian radio broadcaster with a really actually large audience of people. This isn't some fringe thing who figured out that that's the day the world was going to end. May 21st, 2011 at 6 p.m. And literally they spent a hundred million dollars spreading that message. Well, here we are. Maybe some of us wish the world would have ended on that day. We would have had to go through some of the last uh, stuff that we've gone through. But you can see that all throughout history, people thought the world was going to end. Now, there's still that question out there, isn't there? Maybe you have that question. Maybe I have that question. The question of when is the world going to end? Or are we living in the last days? Are we living in the last days? Now, my answer might surprise you based on what I just told you. But I can tell you confidently today, as we record this, we are, yes, living in the last days. Confidently, I can tell you that. Yes, we are living in the last days, but be careful, be very careful how you define last days. So let me do that for you. How does the Bible define the last days? Because it's, it's a rather vague term at places in the scripture. But for our purposes and, and what the Bible teaches us is the last days is the time period between the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and his ascension into heaven and his second coming. That age, or as Jesus says, to the end of the age, that age between those events Those are what's considered in the scripture as the last days. The time between Jesus' first coming and his last coming. And that's where we find ourselves today in 2022. We find ourselves in the proverbial last days or the end of the age. The final days. And see, nobody knows when the actual end of all things will be. In fact, the scripture tells us that Jesus doesn't even know that. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 35 and 36, Jesus says this, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son himself, but only the Father. So if I was on here today and I was telling you, hey, it's gonna be the end, this is the end, it's gonna happen the next two years or next five years or tomorrow, then you need to stop watching this video. You need to stop watching this video and never watch anything coming from this church again, or at least me, (laughs) so you can watch Dean. But I promise you, if you ever hear that, Uh, that you should not believe it because Jesus tells us explicitly in the scripture. So you and I, we live in this story. We live in this in-between time, but we live in this story that God is writing, this redemptive history, which 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 will find its culmination in his coming. And this, here's the good news, this is a story of hope. This is a story of hope And this is a story that we live in where we should not be afraid. We should never, ever be afraid. We should be awake in the midst of this time. We should be alert. We should be prepared. And we should be able to read the signs of the times and read the signs that God has told us to look for. Not though chasing after exact date or exact time, but be able to read our times and know how to live with wisdom in the midst of them. Hey, I do know this for sure. You and I, as you watch this, we're one day closer to the end. And let me say this, we're also, you and I, one day closer to our personal end. And there's probably a better chance that your personal end will come before the end. And so no matter if we're talking about the end of all things or the end of all your things and the end of all mine, because we're all going to die, we should live with wisdom and we should live with hope and we should live knowing that Christ is with us. 
So I'm going to show you this video. You're going to watch this. We're going to come back. We're going to dive into the book of Revelation. So watch this. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back. Hey, by the way, we are down here in New Kensington at Fridays on 5th. You got to check this out. It's awesome. Food trucks, music, all kinds of things. Love to have you come down here and be a part of this. Right behind me is the Pittsburgh Crepes truck. We actually just had them at our church up in Franklin Park uh, last weekend. So come down, check out Fridays on 5th. I think it goes on once a month on Friday night. So Love you to be a part of that. So here we go. You ready? We're going to dive in to, uh, to the book of Revelation, and we're going to lay some foundation that's going to take us through these next four weeks. So this is kind of foundational stuff. We're going to talk about some more specific stuff in the later weeks, but you got to get this stuff first. So you got to get the foundation first. So remember, the tagline on this sermon series, it's for the first line is, in the last days, and then the tagline is, wisdom for the end. Or let me also say this, wisdom for the end or your end. So this works for both, whether your end comes first or the end comes first. This is good information for you. So by the way, when we start out on this, by the way, it's revelation, not revelations. Like it's the river, not the rivers church. We do this in Pittsburgh. We add S's to everything. It's revelation. Now that word in the Greek in revelation is the word apocalyptus. So um, that actually means in the Greek, it means an unveiling, a disclosing of heavenly or future realities. So Revelation deals with a current reality, but it also deals with future realities. Now, this book, this letter, this prophecy is written by uh, John. That's what it tells us. Now, there's some debate over which John. Was it John the Apostle? Was it John the Elder? There's a couple figures of John in the New Testament history, and they're not in complete agreement over who actually wrote this. But it's also written from the prison island of Patmos which is off the coast of Greece. You could go there, it's beautiful now. Like go and check it out. Uh, but you can make a trip there. Maybe, maybe our cameraman Matt will like, show you a little picture of it right here. You can see how beautiful, maybe you take your next vacation there. But it was no vacation for John. And he was there and he received this revelation from the Lord uh, about some things that we're going to look at. Now I wanna to read to you Revelation chapter one, verse one through three. Three. Now, remember I said this is, a, this is a story of hope. This is a story so that we will not be afraid. So when you dive into this stuff, it's not meant to scare you. It's not meant to bring fear. It's actually meant to bring the complete opposite. So this is what it said, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. It says, the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. By the way, the word soon, what is that word? If you watch The Chosen, Jesus says that at one point. He says, soon, what is that word? Well, that could be at any time, any point. Like the scripture says that one day is like a thousand years to the Lord or a thousand years is like one day. And so soon is quite relative. He says, these things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, catch this word in, in verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. So I'm blessed just by reading it today. Blessed by the truth that is in here. Not afraid, not cursed, but blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it or read it like you are. Like you're hearing it, you're reading it. Blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart. 
what is written in it because the time is near. So blessed, not scared, not afraid, but blessed, blessed. And this, you have to re remember that because if you don't remember that it's actually hopeful, then you're either going to get scared or you're going to get weird. You're either going to get scared or you're going to get weird with this stuff. So you are blessed by hearing it. Now, the book of Revelation, when I said I was going to give you some foundation, there's a couple foundational things that it's meant to teach us. So I want to give you four foundational things that the book, as an overview, as a foundation for us, that it's meant to do. The first thing is this. It's meant to tell us that Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords, and he is victorious. Revelation is meant for you to know that the Lord is the Lord of all, that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of all. He is the overcomer. He is the ruler. He is not just the lamb anymore. He's the lion. He is the lion and the lamb, the ruler, the overcomer, the one who is in control of everything. So you got to get that. You have to understand that one of the main purposes of this book, one of the foundational things of this letter is for you to know that Jesus is Lord. He is Lord back then, and he is Lord now. He was Lord when there was a Roman Caesar, and he is Lord when there are presidents and leaders today. He is the real ruler and the real king. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. We've kind of touched on this, is have hope. No matter what come, comes, have hope. Have hope in the Lord, the fact that he is the king. Have hope in your life no matter what comes. And many people believe that when this book was written, there was terrible persecution uh, that was happening under Diocletian, the Roman emperor, uh, who was doing crazy persecution to the church. And so this letter was meant to give them hope and their hope, hope in their life, whether it was persecution for them or whether it's a pandemic for us, whether it's Romans back then or it's Russians now, have hope have hope. The book is meant to give you hope throughout the age, throughout the entire age that, that God is leading us through. Have hope. Third thing is, is calling the church to be on mission and to be unified. Did you realize that the first two chapters of this book are dedicated to just seven churches of that day? The first two whole chapters are dedicated to speaking directly to the church, calling them to be on mission and to be unified, to be not bunkering down, but to be a blessing in the world, not hiding, but helping, not fearful, but faithful, not silent, but sharing the good news of Jesus Christ into the world. That's for us at the river too. God's called us to be on mission and to be unified to share the good news with the world and our communities. That's what God's called us to. And it's so important that this revelation is spoken directly to the churches. It's spoken to believers and to the church, calling them to a way and the way of Jesus. That's what, that's what this revelation is calling us to. And then the fourth thing is this, it's worship. It's worship. This book, this revelation is full of worship. To worship God with your whole life because he is worthy. Because he is worthy. That's why, that's what this book does. It's calling you and I to worship because God is worthy of our worship. You realize the word throne is in almost every chapter of this book. The word throne and what happens around that throne is worship. It's worship that happens around that throne. So we are called to worship God with our whole life. We're called to give him our all because he is worthy. And, and I want you to see, to close this message out, I want, to see, I want you to see what John saw because John tells us he gets a picture of Jesus that, that he has been hearing from, from behind him, but he turns around and he sees the one who is speaking to him. And it's such an awesome passage of scripture. But in John chapter one, verse 12, this is, this is what uh, he writes. John says this, 
I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. So he says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Those are the seven churches that we talked about earlier. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man. That word that comes, that term comes from the book of Daniel. And Jesus referred to himself as the son of man often. So we're getting a picture of Jesus. It says, dressed in a robe, this is his priestly robe. This is Jesus as priest, prophet, priest, king. It says he is standing in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. That's royalty. The gold is signifying royalty. The hair on his head, like mine, was white, like wool, as white as snow, as white as snow and his eyes were like a blazing fire. So anytime you hear white hair in the scripture, it means wisdom. Remember, the, t- the, title, for our, the title for our message is wisdom for the end, okay? There is wisdom in Jesus. This picture of Jesus, he is wise with white hair, like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like blazing fire. They see through everything. The eyes, they're blazing like fire. They can see through us, in us. They can see our motives. That is what signified there. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. Now, this is very interesting because nowhere else in ancient Greek is this word used, this burning bronze. It's, it's, it's probably about the judgment of God. Anytime bronze is used, it's about the judgment of God, and it's his feet. The foundation is firm of who Jesus is, and his judgments are correct and they are, they are reliable. They are sturdy. His judgment is sound. And his feet uh, were like bronze glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of the rushing waters. When God speaks, his voice is powerful and it changes things. It was like the rushing of the ocean. And then he goes on, he says, in his right hand, he held seven stars. Now, that's either the seven pastors of the seven churches we talked about, or it's the seven stars are also representative of angels. Either way, angels or pastors, nobody really knows. Both are messengers. He holds the message in his hand. What's that message? It's the message of the gospel. He holds that in his hand. And coming out of his mouth, was a sharp double-edged sword. It's truth coming from the mouth of God. And truth sometimes hurts. And you'll find in this book, in the Revelation, that sometimes the truth hurts. It cuts us a little bit, but it cuts us to heal us. That's why it's a double-edged sword. The other edge of that is a healing that comes from the Word of God. His face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. That's representing the glory of God. Like in heaven, the scripture tells us there is no need for the sun because the glory of God fills uh, everything with light. So his his face was shining like the sun in all its brilliance. And here's what John tells us. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. (laughs) That's what happens when you see Jesus in his full glorified form is the boom, you're down, like you're dead, you're passed out. And now notice this is what happens. It says, then he placed his right hand on me. The right hand in the ancient world was the hand of blessing. It was the hand of welcome. It was the hand of, of fellowship. And so Jesus places his right hand on John and he says these words to him. And these are beautiful words. These are words you could build your whole life on. He says this, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, which takes us back to the beginning. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. If these are the last days, don't be afraid. Jesus says, don't, don't worry. Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am forever. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I'm alive forever and ever. And because he lives, we can live too. Remember, this is only one week after Easter and he's still risen. He is risen. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Jesus saying, I hold the key. I'm in control of everything. Even death and hell itself. 
I am in control. I got you. I got you. This is the message at the beginning of Revelation. And because Jesus is in control, I didn't even say the title of this message, but we picked songs for every title of this. The title is, um, It's the End of the World as We Know It, which is an old REM song. And the next line of that song is, And I Feel Fine. See, Jesus is in control. If it's the end of the world, I feel fine. I feel fine because he's got me. He's got me. See, this is wisdom. This is wisdom for the end and it, or it's wisdom for your end and my end. Whatever comes first. See, your life should be knowing who Jesus is. This gives us a picture. Knowing who Jesus is. So you can spend your time chasing after times and dates and trying to figure out every little sign. Or you can spend your time chasing <coughs> Jesus, who is the author, the Alpha and Omega, the living one. Knowing his word. You have to know his word. You have to worship him with your life. And you have to know, yes, how to read the signs and to read the times and to know how to live with wisdom in those times. See, as I record this today, it could be the last day. It could be the last day or it could be my last day. Whatever comes first, live it well. Live it well. Live it well in the way that he would have you to live. Amen and amen. Hope you have a blessed day. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.